Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Hearts of Iron 4, TNO, The Last is of Europe. I'm your host, Scottish Mocha Lover, in which what's done cannot be undone. Campbell had left one page report in Campbell's box that morning. It was straightforward, concise, as is Campbell's usual style, both in speech and in writing. Campbell set aside the other folders and reports that had been prepared for him. The economy and the bureaucracy could wait. He slipped out of the report from the folder and had been enclosed in and began to read. He decided he wasn't sure how he felt about what Jimmy had reported. Additionally, or apparently, whatever has been going on at the Aberdeen airport was no longer <clears throat> going on. The military forces that had shown up out of the blue at the airport, closing off certain sections, had left as suddenly as they had appeared. Campbell reported that overnight, his agents had observed the arrival of several additional military transport planes, the subsequent loading of these planes, and then their takeoff. It had taken him only a few hours to clear out of the airport, and now all the areas that had been closed off were accessible once more. Robert McIntyre put the report down and took a long drag of his cooling morning coffee. The time for any sort of action was long gone now. All he could do was hope that this was an isolated, harmless incident, but you never know for sure. Oh boy. And improved relations. Good evening, Scotland. In the wake of the Free England victory, relations between Scotland and England have begun to thaw due to closer political beliefs and no more danger the Cornwall garrison who had been also eliminated in the conflict. Delegates from both countries have agreed to meet in Newcastle upon Tyne to discuss economic opportunities between the two countries. During this meeting, the President of Scotland will meet with the recently elected Prime Minister of England to discuss these opportunities. We have reached out to both governments to ask questions and for comments on this recent development. The English government has declined due to restructuring of the current political structure, while the Scottish government has accepted this request. Mr. Marcus Alveson is here to answer the questions that we prepared for him. Thank you, Mr. Alveson, for answering our questions today. As many of you have heard, the border between England and Scotland has been reopened and is now much easier to cross due to the thawing of relations between the two countries. A friendly football match has been scheduled for the upcoming months between teams located on the border towns. The teams will be announced in the forthcoming weeks. Thank you for tuning in to Scottish News Network today, and have a great rest of your day. What a great day. Now, we have a couple of comms to go through. Hopefully we'll do okay. We can buy a lot of equipment, apparently. And, let's see, the armed forces, they are sort of paranoid, and they're different. Could be worse. And our English poverty rate, well, it's going up ever so slightly. And the approval, of course, is still going down, which I don't understand why it's going down. That doesn't make any sense to me. Especially since we literally sent soldiers and, or maybe at least weaponry, to help out the English down there. So, the armed forces become even further less paranoid. Hopefully, they just don't rise up against us. I don't hope that doesn't happen. Decrease, uh, we could do that, but I kind of want to maybe buy some stuff here. I could really use more guns. And we could really use more guns. Uh, what else can we buy? Support equipment? Us, but... Um, guns, why not? Who cares? You know. We got enough pickle power for now. And... Oh. Alright, these guys... Uh, okay. Black, oh, yeah, it arrives! It burns up under our deal and delivered equipment we ordered on the black market. The payment's been taken care of as well. Excellent. So now we have how many guns? 1,200. Iberic regains control of Algeria. Wow. It's kind of a... Uh, Handsome fellow. Anyways, what will become of Algeria? I don't know. Regardless, so what the first comment that we should address is that someone recommends we play as Tomsk without the T. So basically, Omsk. You know? How'd you know I wanted to play as him? How'd you know I wanted to play as Yazov? So, <clears throat> I have my eyes on Russia, I'll put it like that, but repatriate the refugees. Over the years, thousands of refugees flooded the border, escaping from persecution, both political and racial, or simply fl fleeing from poverty and exploitation. Now, that the collaborations government has fallen. And if free government rules England, these refugees can return home safely. Well, we can't expect everyone to return home every overnight. Some have been living in Scotland for far more than a decade. We can immediately begin preparations to encourage the refugees to return home. And surely they do so safely and without fear for the future. The brainstorm session, huh? Cool. A little bit of lag, but that's alright. And what are our relations with the English? Not very good. Why? Seriously, why? Cornerstone democracy, huh? Uh, English transitional government, food and security, Marshall Wimberley's disbandment speech. Oh boy. Men of the North Ambud County Division, I'm honored to speak to you today at your demobilization ceremony. Oh, they have weekly. Oh, that's not good. Your unit was not so much to do. I was not expected to do so much, I must admit. A original unit of old men and young boys thrown together in the panic days after Dunkirk. When the invasion came, you, your unit fought alongside us being pushed to the north and clashing with the Germans every step of the way. When the war was about to end and we held the convention to declare our independence, we expect to count on the support of the only few scattered Scottish regiments in my own 51st Division. I could hardly expect the officers of a division entirely composed of Englishmen to be the first to offer their services. Rather than lay down their arms and return to their home, they'd rather live in Scotland and fight for the nation of strangers. They were committed to higher cause and Scottish independence, and they were committed to freedom. 
Years went by, and your unit stood with us on guard against the Nazi menace. When the older soldiers had retired, new English, stood, new English men stood up to take their place on the watch. With your help, we've deterred a Nazi invasion and ensured that the people of Scotland would be able to live peacefully and freely. This service will never be forgotten by the grateful North you chose to serve. Now England has been freed, and the danger of invasion is much less than it was before. And you've expressed... And you have expressed interest in returning home, now that your homeland is free. I wish to assure you that I hold no ill will towards you wanting to return home. And this is an amicable separation. On behalf of the Scottish nation, I thank you for your duty and wish you the best of your luck, or best of luck in your future endeavors. Dismissed. Northumberland County Division Template. Oh. Oh. Uh-oh. That's not good. <laughs> Uh-oh. And we do have a horse division, too. Actually, how is that horse division? Uh, cavalry, it's not looking bad. It does require a few. I kind of just prefer the Scottish Guards, to be honest with you. These are 10 combat width. A decreased black market trading, eh. And what's the next step then? Uh, 11 days, we can read the next one. Begin diplomatic relations. Before the Civil War, relationships with our former masters were always tense, with the English revanchism and their German puppeteers threatening to cross the border, forcing us to spend a considerable amount of money in a fortification and border guards. Oh, look at this. We, now we can restart normal diplomatic relations, and the first step will be sending an envoy to the newly formed government. From there, things will naturally evolve, and we hope to establish an embassy soon. Amis, la France nous attend. I've never seen this guy before, I think, or woman, whoever. Jean Bichonal. Huh. Oh. All right. Good luck. You're going to need it, probably. Oh, let's grab some of this defense. Oh, yeah, I should have got more defense earlier. Large exercises shall be replaced with what? More organization. And that's not bad. Planning speed. Out of supply, yeah. Let's go with that one. The momentous question. I'm so, I'm so happy the right side won in England. Who isn't? All those Nazis gone. Those new folks care about the people in the country. As Scotland's no longer in a state of permanent war. But if there's one downside, sir, is that I keep getting asked. So when are you leaving, Mr. Webb? Everyone seems to expect, with the quiet joy, that every Anglo in Scotland is going to pack up their things and go back to England now that things are over. That we're going to do or go to a country burned to ash with rubble in every street and fascist hooligans running around in the gutters. They think everyone's just going, going to leave, and then they can have all their terrible jobs back, and Glasgow is going to be turned into a paradise. You know how much money I put into my mortgage? I saved for years to make my down payment on a four-room bedroom house in the suburbs. That's on top of the corner stop I was running before that. All I, I spent all that money, and just when I'm finally able to get to my head above water, every customer asks when I'm going back a small talk. So what would moving do to my son? Scotland's all he's ever known. All his friends are there in the school. Such a massive interruption would be terrible for him, especially since he's doing well in his classes. The school tells me that, and then after that they send me to a pamphlet talking about how to transfer a child to the English school system. This attitude makes me sick. Everyone wants me and my family out and say that we have no excuse not to. But I'm staying, I'm not leaving, I'm going to outlast them all. Every time I get asked, only stiffens my resolve to stay here. I resolve that when they stop asking, I'll still be here, may God be witness. But after that, will you? Maybe. I mean, is he going to assimilate? Like, that's a real question. Is he fully assimilated? He might be. He might not be. I don't know. Is there that much of a racial difference between Scots and English? Maybe I shouldn't ask that question. Hmm. Barely paranoid? That's good. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't ask that question. I don't know. I'm a simple American, so. They still... What's there still, is there still something supposed to do with the monthly English approval rate? Like, come on, man. Seriously. The brainstorm session. All right, sir, said the government clerk, standing in front of a chalkboard. Here's my proposal for the ex exile situation. Almost all refugees from England declared themselves at the border and requested asylum. Oh, we have a record of that. We got their names. We know where they moved to or ended up. So that's the database of every Eng Englander who entered the country in the past 20 years, which are going to be the ones who probably want to leave the most and are the ones we want to help. So what do we do is mail them an offer. If they leave Scotland, we give them a small stipend to help them with the moving and resettlement costs. As at the customs office, they file a notice of emigration, and they get a check in return. Then they go home with some cash, making them happy. We get rid of them gently, making us happy. And since they're gone, we don't mistreat them, making the English people and Himmler happy. And those they don't want to leave are already happy with us, which does make us happy with them. So, it's simple. It diffuses a potential race riot, has basically no downside, and makes everyone, from the refugees to the citizen to the government, happy. What do you think, sir? The boss was happy, too. Ooh, daily political power game, monthly population, factory output for two years. Ooh. All right, hey, let's take a look. All right, so seriously, minus point two. Why? Why? The pop population change is slowly going down, which is nice. I love this whole population stuff, but the road is open. The age of fear is over. Without the Germans breathing down on our necks, we can finally stop worrying about the future and start planning for the long term. While the current situation is far from positive, as the consequences of the English Civil War will still be felt for many years to come, the future looks less bleak, and that's already a pretty gosh darn good start. Uh, let's talk about money now. We have a little bit. Never mind. Uh, so, oh, darn, Hadrish died. That sucks. Let's see. Oh, the long town friend. 
It's a long town situated on the south side of the River Esk in northern Cumbria. It's a small town of about 3,000 people. Nothing of much real significance happens in a rural town such as this, but a recent sporting event has drawn considerable interest in both Scotland and England. After the Himmler victory in the English Civil War, many people have been interested in the normalization of relations with Scotland. Nowhere has this been more anticipated than in the border region for the longest time, which is a great tune. Uh, the line was widely considered to be the boundary between... The free world and the slave. As such, it was heavily fortified, home to many military drills. Now the tension has stopped, and what soldiers there on the border are in more a relaxed mood. On the opposite border, the Scottish town of Gretna proposed a football match between their local team and the long town in order to celebrate this relaxed atmosphere. That's a bad idea. Permission was granted by the English and Scottish governments who felt the idea was sound. Today, a bus full of Scottish football players went over the River Sark and into England, bringing a group of local fans in tow. A, sm a similar attendance in England made their way to the town park in Longtown to watch the match. The game opened with a short ceremony with the mayors of Gretna and Longtown declared their hope that England and Scotland would be at peace forevermore, and that the bonds between the countries would heal and grow stronger. Unfortunately, that seemed to be the most interesting part of the match. The teams were made up of local amateurs and showed on the pitch. Uh, the game was eventually called with a score of 1-1. The teams then shook hands and left for home with the possibility of a match to really determine the victor still up in the air. Perhaps a tie is in the best result, diplomatically speaking. Yeah, that's a... Yeah, I don't know. A competition? A, 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 like a competition like that between these two nations? I don't know. Maybe, mm, I don't know, man. But hey, at least that turned out much better than we thought it did. A strong Scotland. Scotland, the OFN. Oh, that's not a bad idea. I like the political power. Let's do that one. So, the Organization of Free Nations is the strongest democratic alliance in the world, grouping together what remains of the Allies during the last war, and those nations who fought their way back to democracy as a beacon of freedom in these troubled times. As a democratic nation ourselves, it would be wise to strengthen our ties with the Alliance. This would mean an increase in trade, tourism, uh, tourism, and more than anything, military protection from the U.S. of A. While actually joining the Alliance is still a matter we'll need to discuss properly, establishing good and amicable relations with its nations will only be beneficial to us. Army Movements in the Highlands Robert McIntyre looked at the map pinned on his on the cockboard in front of him. He stood with Jimmy Halliday and the agent who had first taken notice of the strange movements. You sure? asked Robert McIntyre. The agent spoke up before Halliday could even speak. Our intelligence outposts in the region had noted an increase in movement of men and equipment into the Highlands. A few of the agents we have embedded into the military, as, as, few as, as well as a few of the lower-ranking officers who cooperate with us, notified us of the movement as well. Robert McIntyre nodded and stared at the map along with Halliday. We should get moving on this, said Halliday. We have no idea what they could be planning. They could just be an ordinary exercise, or they might be preparing for some sort of operation. There's no way of knowing the, uh, the information that we have, as we don't have any agents actually at the exercise, nor do we have eyes on them. Robert nodded once more. Agreed. What are our options in terms of figuring out what's going on in the Highlands? Halliday paused for a moment, thinking before responding. Well, we could go in loud, or we could try this quiet approach. Both have their own drawbacks, of course. We could arrest the leaders of the exercise, generals, colonels, what have you, and begin an investigation as to what we're doing, or what they're doing. We could also go in quietly, attempt to sneak in some agents while following up with the aerial surveillance via spy plane. Either way, there's a chance that either the infiltration will fall, uh, or the exercise turns out to be legitimate, and then we start having to arrest some of our own top military leaders falsely. Robert McIntyre turned and asked the agent to leave. As soon as the door was shut, Robert McIntyre and Halliday began deliberation as to which route would be the safest and most rewarding. We needed something or else... The opportunity to find the truth will be lost to end of the London coach ride. Several mounted policemen in open top carriage arrived at the grounds of Buckingham Palace that morning, sparking a flurry of flash bulbs uh, from the media on site. There was a momentous occasion, though one repeated many times before. Uh, however, this one was extremely special, for the couple who got out of the carriage and entered the building was the Ambassador of Scotland and his wife. A member of the diplomatic corps greeted the couple as they walked through the Ambassador's entrance. As they were led through the palace, the Ambassador was nervous. He had been in training, or had been trained in diplomatic procedure, yes, and was aware of how the Ambassadors were received at the Court of St. James, but... Now a whole new provisional government was in place, one that was in a technical limbo when it came to a monarchy. When he passed the Grand Staircase, the ambassador thought for a moment he might be able to go to Canada to meet the real head of state. Claude Auchinleck was waiting for the ambassador to en as he entered the throne room. The ambassador walked over and introduced himself and his wife while giving a little bow just to be safe. He then handed over a letter to from the President of Scotland and for Auchinleck, informing him the ambassador did represent the Scottish government and was highly qualified for the task. Alkenlech read the letter for a moment and smiled and shook the ambassador's hand. At the moment, for the first time since 1707, Scotland was recognized as an independent nation by the English government. A dream fulfilled. Let's hope so. Alright, so what do we do here? English minorities going down. Yay, we don't like minorities? Hmm. Oh, whatever. Uh, barely paranoid, indifferent. Infiltrate the exercise. Investigate the army exercise in the Highlands. Disperse the army. Okay, so we have enough political power that I might just do all these. Let's just infiltrate. Or do infiltrate? Send spy planes and security service. We're gonna because they're barely paranoid. They're indifferent. 
this is probably the best time to do it. So after the road is open, of course, we're going to do Scotland OFN, U.S. military aid, business, American businesses, tourism to Scotland, our allies across. Wow, that's a lot more stability. I like that. Scotland and the English. Open our economies. That's not bad. Um, friends, not rivals. I like that, too. I think that's really good. Civilian budget boost. Oh, no, we got to build, 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 build. And what are we building? Civilian factories? Not bad. We got to put six days left, so that's not bad. All right. So after this, we're going to go ahead and grab some of this for a little bit more south attack. And, of course, breakthrough. Uh, so, so basically, someone's asking, will England keep their, you know, their word? I think since we help them out so much that they shouldn't really try to hurt us, right? All right? So that's kind of what someone's, someone was kind of pondering in the columns from yesterday. With England being, you know, okay and neutral for now, will they really backstab us and try to take us under? Maybe. So, send spy plans and security, security service agents to infiltrate the exercise. You walk into the PM's office. All Jimmy Halliday had told you was that you were needed for a special assignment that you need to pick someone who you thought would be reliable in infiltration task. You had heard some talk of the military coagulating in the Sp Scottish Highlands. News gets around fast at the security service headquarters, so while you could hazard a guess as to why you were needed, that was in fact anyone's guess. Maybe it was time to prepare for a fight against a gosh darn collaboration in the South, but really you had no idea. As the wooden door swung open into the office, you quickly figured out your answer. To the right, you saw a map of the Scottish Highlands pinned on a board with different objective marks out in black pen. To your left was a table of what could only be a Scottish uniform and some tools, such as a small camera, a long-range radio, and so on. Directly in front of you stood your boss and your boss's boss, Robert McIntyre. It's a pleasure to meet you, sirs, as you say, as you shake Robert McIntyre's extended hand. The pleasure is all mine, Agent Cragg. I wish I could meet you under more agreeable circumstances, but unfortunately, as you are here for work today, you nod and Mr. Halliday speaks. I'll be frank with you, Logan. This will be a dangerous mission. If you look at the map, you'll see the Scottish Highlands. I'm sure you've heard the rumor that the army is coalescing in that region for a training exercise. Your mission will be to infiltrate the exercise and find out exactly what's going on. Tensions are at all-time high. And you need to find out if this exercise is an actual exercise to prepare for the English or if it's to prepare for an action against Scotland. You know how it is, Mr. Halliday. Halliday continues. After an hour of briefing preparation, you are dismissed to a truck waiting outside with your team. You hop in the truck and drive off to a safe house near your Highlands. Spying is risky business. God help us all. Oh, boy. Ah, the road is open, my friends. The road is open. Nice. Doesn't help as much, but whatever. Oh, there goes Tricky. Oh, only episode three and Tricky Dick is finally surrendering or surrendering. Going bye bye. No, oh, bye bye, Tricky Dick. Uh, let's do tourism to Scotland. Our homeland possesses a rugged beauty that makes it very attractive to tourists. From the highlands to the castles in Edinburgh and around the various lochs, many would enjoy a trip around our many beauties, both historical and natural. By increasing our ties with the OFN, we can sign treaties making it easier for tourists to visit our respective countries. From there, we'll surely experience a boom in visitors, which will translate into new jobs for the tourism sectors and more tax revenue for our coffers. Ah, I was thinking about that economy. I love it. Support weapons, sign me up. And what's the one over here? Oh, our spies have successfully infiltrated the exercise. You do your best to mimic the gait that most of the soldiers seem to possess. Tired, heavy laden, heavy laden, and pushing just hard enough to keep pace with everyone else. Of course, it isn't, it isn't the easiest to walk to mimic when you only recently began to be part of the exercise, but you're able to figure it out mostly. As you march with other soldiers through the health of the hills, you steal a glance at the sky. Somewhere up there was a small plane that was continually snapping photographs of what was going on the ground. While you were making mental notes and taking photos on the ground, transmitting them at night, Getting in had not been too difficult. You had arrived with your team and split off into different directions with the main camp only to move onto its heart at multiple entrances so as not to seem too suspicious. You had been brought before your own commanding officer and explained that you had essentially lost your way out in the Highlands. He had bought it and after reviewing your <clears throat> forged documents, deemed you fit for duty and sent you on your way to be ingra ingrained with your unit. You have been mixing with a unit of infantrymen and since a few days ago have been living the life of one. You've been spending the last few nights mapping out the camp as well as the guard routes and their shift changes. You think it might be either time that the night or night after attempt to sneak into the HQ and see what you can find, even if everything seems straightforward. Director Halliday needs to know, of course, or else they might make an uninformed uh, and disastrous decision. It's a big risk, but, you know, you gotta take one for Scotland. A superior industry, that's not bad. Oh, oh, maybe we should go for that one as fast as possible next. Yeah, we... Mm, 
you know what, after this, I, I still want to go with this one first, and then we'll go with that one. So, that's a standard exercise. As you sit in the middle of the thicket with your radio out, you take another look at the nearby road to make sure you can't see any signs of anybody. You identify this road as one of the least traveled by the soldiers. It led to a remote village, but there was nothing there that usually attracted soldiers. No bars, clubs, nothing. Just a clan of people trying to make a living in the highlands. After one last glance, you're satisfied that you shouldn't have any unwanted visitors and began your transmission. Sugar, Oval, Charlie, Abel, Nab, Tired, Love, Doug, Hal Copy. <clears throat> uh, let's Oh, okay. The radio hisses back at you. Roger, free one. We read you clear. What do you have to report? You clear your throat before you begin. Command, there's nothing aloof afoot here. It appears that this is simply a standard military exercise. My team and I found no evidence that this is anything but standard. I've taken p several photographs of the room, of the map room, and this exercise I participated in show that this is specifically to both prepare the men and, and keep them on their toes until such a time that we are at war with one of our enemies, be they German or collaborators, over. A moment passes and another voice, is co voice come on the radio. You recognize it as Mr. Halliday. All right, free one. You and your team are free to extract. Do so at your earliest opportunity to minimize the chance of being captured or dismissed. The radio went silent. Command, cut the line. You pack up the radio and your other equipment in a pile, leaving it there so that you can grab it on your way out of the zone. All you have to do is sneak back into the HQ, remove any trace of your identity, and back, and then back into your barracks to grab your official items and leave. Peace, oh cake. 650th anniversary of the Battle of Bannockburn. Today, on June 23rd, 1964, many patriots and members of the Nationalist Party have assembled at the illustrious field of Bannockburn in central Scotland. Ministers of the cabinet, as well as many government representatives, joined, although the president had sent an excuse for not attending thanks to his busy schedule. This sublimely prepared site will be a place for a day of celebration, and tomorrow will act as a place for the first reenactment of the Battle of Bannockburn. During the Scottish Interregnum of in 1291, Edward I of England was declared Lord Paramount of Scotland in his deceitful arbitration. This Plantagenet had been declared the next king of Scotland, this king immediately began working against Edward I. This led to the first Sco war of Scottish independence, lasting from 1296 to 1328. Wow, that's a long time. At first, Edward, hammer of the Scots, defeated us in battle after battle. By 1304, Scotland was brought to its knees by, tier no by near total conquest. In 1306, the famous Robert de Bruce seized the Scottish throne and started a relentless guerrilla campaign against English. Edward I's deaths and the incapability of his son, later infamous for his downfall at the hands of his own wife, contributed to the reemergence of Scotland. Wanting to relive the siege or relieve the siege of the Stirling Castle, Edward II prepared for the famous battle. Only half of his 27,000 requested men arrived, however. Robert's numerically inferior troops dealt him the fatal blow, killing up to 10,000 of his troops while losing less than half of the, his themselves, and forced him to retreat into the decisive battle lasting for two days. A few years later, the independence was manifested via diplomatic means, which their ancestors, we, just recently regained. These deeds of the Scottish heroes shall enjoy an everlasting legacy. We fight for freedom which no good man surrenders but with his life. Hmm. Another day at sea, Alex rubbed his eyes. The salt stung more than usual. It was just another day when the catch was low. As he looked down into the North Sea, he frowned. The thriving industry had now started to drop slowly in Scotland. The once large fleet had started to dwindle down slowly. The other fishermen remarked that the Germans and the Norwegians had overfished the North Sea, causing it to decline. Some others blamed it on the overfishing of the current fish stocks. As the boat motored into Aberdeen, he saw the much larger trawlers and even some factory ships leave port. He scoffed at the factory ship leaving. If it was anything that was killing the industry, it was these corporations and their ships, he said to himself. They fished on days and days and on and on and end and process and the process of the fish inside the ship. He took his head and sailed into port. Once he arrived at the mooring, he called over a dock hand to help him unload the few crates he had full of fish. Today it was only him and his first mate, Tate. The dock hand looked like he had just woken up a few minutes ago and pulled down the winch for his the crates of fish. Only three days a day, with the third being barely full. Not much cod in the waters of Scotland anymore. As the dock hand left, Alex and Tate began to clean the boat. It was hard, but rewarding to the two men. As the boat was finally done, an hour and a half after they came to the port, they could finally collect their earnings and go home to sleep. Alex walked into the fishmonger's office to collect his earnings for the day. After getting his check, he shrugged and put it in his pocket. Once he was back by the boat, he split half of it with Tate. After the money had been split, the two men went their separate ways. One thing that did stand out to Tate was he saw his cut was almost the amount of fish they had hauled. Could the stocks be making a comeback? It seems ground fish is making a comeback. Encourage nationalism. Scotland first. Better safe than sorry. Our nation in the north. Oh, not bad. Yeah, it's actually really good. Wow. Even more political power. Oh, wow. That's not bad. So, I did say I wanted to do this more, but we discovered that they're not doing much, so I'm not going to do it this time. They said that nothing seems out of the ordinary, so... Now I'm starting to get personally a little paranoid, there goes, there goes Borman, about a potential coup, so... I want to do this, but... Oh, there goes Tricky Dick. Holy crap, minus 10%. That could be really good. American businesses. Oh, that could be so good. 
I want to get down to here and just expertise, but a strong Scotland. With their external threats subsidized, we can now concentrate on our own nation. Despite a limited trade with the OFN, the traumatic separation from the UK was far, far from easy, and it left deep scars that will need to be remended in the future. We should immediately begin a concerted effort to ensure that our beloved homeland can grow both economically and socially. We are finally free and will enjoy this freedom to the fullest. Absolutely. Nice. Any more budget stuff? No? Okay. Mr. McIntyre goes to Washington. Robert McIntyre's crazed work week began with a long flight out of Edinburgh into the dead of night. He tried to catch some sleep, but <clears throat> he was extremely excited. There was a brief stop at St. John's for refueling, and then it went on the way to his final destination at 12 o'clock that day as the band arrived. Uh, played arrival fanfare number one, and he and his wife stepped onto the red carpet at Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C., greeted by a cordon of U.S. military personnel, the U.S. Chief of Protocol, a reception committee, and an American school child with a bouquet of flowers. The Scottish and American national anthems were played before a motorcade took them to Blair House. The next day was the entrance ceremony held on the White House of Lawn. The President of the United States met McIntyre there, along with many other government officials. The anthems were played, a 21 gun suit was fired off, and McIntyre inspected the American troops. Then came the remarks where the President welcomed the visitor, and the McIntyre thanked him and then everyone else. They went inside the White House, and McIntyre signed the guest book. There was an exchange of gifts, a quick vote in the Oval Office, and then McIntyre departed for the State Department in luncheon. That night it was a state dinner in the White House. She crab soup. Beef and corn payoff were served. A toast between the two leaders was made before dinner. Afterwards, a performance by Frank Sinatra was held in the East Room before the night closed with sparkling wine and social dancing in the entrance hall. It was a long day, but even still, McIntyre was excited as he went to the bed. Tomorrow, we will address a joint meeting of Congress and host a return dinner at Scottish Embassy. He would stay long, he decided. And then some of the historical sites as well, like Mount Vernon and Arlington National Cemetery. He loved the trip already and hoped the President would one day visit Scotland as well. And he hoped this makes the best of... Friends with the Americans. Oh, man, we don't even get, the, like, actual names of, like, was it LBJ? Is he, is he president? Oh, oh, well, I, I guess that explains why. <laughs> the president, <laughs> they didn't give us the name of the president because McCormick's leading it. Uh, yeah, F, yeah, JFK literally just died, so what do you expect? Well, that's probably the worst time to go visit the president when, they're, <laughs> when the president's dead. Anti-aircraft, not bad. And a superior industry. Our homeland is cold and covered in hills, which means we can't help to expand our uh, agricultural business. Industry, however, is another matter entirely. Since the Industrial Revolution, Edinburgh and Glasgow has been home to important industrial facilities. While the collapse of the UK had negative effects on trade and production, our industrial base is still intact. All it takes is a large investment into our businesses, and we'll be able to expand our productive activities once again. We get a whole civilian factor after we do this one and improve our industrial expertise. The military exercises has ended. So it's over then, we don't have any more chances, Robert McIntyre said to Halliday, looking for confirmation. Halliday nodded, the exercises are indeed over, the main base of operations is already dismantled, and the army is split off to head back to their individual bases. You can't really investigate something that no longer exists. Robert McIntyre breathed out and sank into a seat. He thought on the army exercises a bit more, and reasoned that no more brain power should be wasted on this particular event. It had come and it had gone, he hoped, of course, that the exercises had been legitimate and designed to prepare for a fight with an external enemy. However, there's no way to confirm that, that any longer. At least he thought to himself, they hadn't decided to take the moment to descend from the highlands on the rest of Scotland and install a martial government, of course. That didn't mean they wouldn't do it in the future. God knows the relationship between the civilian government and the Scottish military apparatus wasn't in good shape. All right, he finally said to Jimmy Halliday. We may have missed this opportunity, but we won't miss the next one if possible. Who knows what the military is up to? Halliday nodded. It was a sad fact, but a fact nonetheless, that while the civilian government technically had the power over the military, the military itself was mostly a private entity. That wasn't much they shared with the government. Everything they had to be pried from them. Well, if they do something like this again, then pry we will, and you bet we will. They're barely paranoid too, so... Alright, not bad. Oh, can I buy some stuff? Let's go buy some this, this time. A red sky at night. As president of Scotland, it's my duty to inform the populace of the current events <clears throat> that have taken in place that, that have great importance or import from the citizens of Scotland. Doubtlessly, you know that I speak on the final defeat of the savage regime to the south. There's been much celebration at the news, but also a deal of skepticism and fear. Some ask what happens next and what this means for Scotland. Well, I tell you now, Scotland has now persevered through the darkest trial in our history, and we now stand as an independent nation. For years, we've operated under the principle that a fascist invasion could happen at any time. Surely you remember your air raid drills, your mandatory service, your constant reminders of a terrifying conflict brought on by unholy machines and sciences. Many times you watched the news closely, wondering if you would see the announcer say the final battle for Scottish freedom that had begun. And many times you heard the stories of refugees telling horrifying tales and saying that you are certainly next. Those days are over. 
Gone are the ways of refugees fleeing oppression from down south. Gone is a militarized border, and gone are all the Germans and their lackeys from the Isle. Marshal Auchinleck and Himmler now greet Scotland as an independent and democratic power no different than from themselves. Now the immediate existential threat to Scotland has ended to be replaced with calm and rel relatively easy relations with the English. Once more we have triumphed and we have earned our right to survive as a democratic power in Western Europe. Now we know that any challenge after this one can be easily overcome and we are on the edge of a new golden age. Scotland can now coast forever. Well, I don't know about forever, but eventually. Oh, there goes Rex Komasayat, Niederlander. Oh, I gotta play this awesome sometime. Well, the bald man won. First things first. Like always, the lost generation. A superior industry. Let's take a look at things, how they're doing. Let's see, poverty is getting better, slowly. Uh, industrial expertise is not doing too bad. And German restores order over Central Europe. Well, good for them. Minorities have equal rights, huh? Alright, that, that's fine with me, whatever. Superior industry, after that. Um, a better education. Oh, we gotta do that one too. It's evident that the future lies in superior technologies, and for this to happen, we need an adequate schooling system. If we can't upgrade our institutions, then our industries will soon become obsolete, and then we'll have to rely on foreign expertise for even the most basic aspects of our economy. To address this issue, we'll increase funding for our schools and expand Edinburgh's university to include several technical and engineering courses. With our new graduates, we'll have all the brains we need to ensure that we are set on the right path of progress. Oh, George Jellicoe is elected prime minister. Oh, uh, maybe I should pay attention to this. Oh, that, oh, that sucks. It failed, whatever. Jellico, what does that mean for us? NDL. The Admiral's son takes over the ship of state. National Democratic League. Oh, boy. Conservative democracy. Ooh. Is that good or bad? Oops, I just dropped my pen. I hope they hold their end of the bargain. A democratic England. Building a nation. England reborn. Um, so there was a comment saying that should I... Oh, the free world. Look at that. They said they will return. Um, should... What was it? Do I plan to rejoin England peacefully? My goal is still ha to try to keep uh, you know, an independent Scotland as best we possibly can. That's why I kind of want to get inside the OFN first before anything bad happens. So let's grab some more land out of attack. That'll be kind of helpful. But yeah. Yeah. We have eight divisions, which isn't bad, actually. We gotta look at that manpower. Look at that. Not bad. It is slowly going down. Uh, how many guns do we have? We need more anti tank, which is not good. Ooh, we don't really have a lot of divisions now, do we? If that's the case, making these guys 40 combo with might not be bad. Oh, when are you going to be done with this? 67, huh. How long would it take for us to get this, actually, instead? Oh, 60%. 67, 60. Ah, oh, just so much. It makes more sense to do that one. That a peace conference is too. Oh, boy. Oh, Slovakia, that's fine. The dream falters. Poland is lost. Goodbye, Poland. Hmm. Do that for now. I would like our divisions to be bigger. Because 10 combo width is, is okay, but... Mm. Does the armed force become even less paranoid? Well, I, mean, I guess that's probably good to do. So, ever since we became independent, we had to constantly worry about our southern neighbor. The fear of an English attack, often fueled by hostile mo troop movements, forced our army to be on the constant alert at all times, and this, of course, has degenerated into paranoia, and even a single airplane in the sky was enough to warrant full mobilization. Now that peace is finally returned, the army can be, de can be permanently demobilized. It will be difficult to return to peacetime military administration, and surely some of our generals will complain, but Scotland needs normality, and we need it now. The ugly truth? Goodbye, Poland trips to the North Sea, though. Anything shout out Engineer Darren to the man in the water? They had been searching for oil in the North Sea with no avail. I'm not getting anything, mate. Callum yelled to the yelled this to Darren, who was still putting or sitting on a repurposed fishing trawler that was now home to a small group of engineers and scientists sent by the government to possibly find oil in the North Sea. Well, Krill, come back on the boat. Callum scrambled back onto the ship and took off his air tank. It was cold as heck down the water. Callum thought. 
Gosh darn, you really got nothing? Ask Darwin who was helping him get off the scuba gear. Callum nodded. Well, I'll tell Bill to get the crane ready to lift off the drill, replied Callum. He noticed Darren looking distraught. Hey, don't worry, there's definitely oil down there. We just need to look in the right places. Callum said this while laying a hand on Darren's shoulder. Drew, now let's get this drill. Let's get drilling, drilling, drilling. Yeah, with the military completely unparanoid, that's really good then. And since we're here. Oh, we actually have a ship. A oh, second carrier, look at that. Now train until we have no oil left. Or no fuel, I should really say. Oil is one thing, but fuel is another thing. Wow. Liquid reserves is 32 million. God. Oh, there goes Tomsk. But that's not Omsk. I've, I've heard that the AI always loses as Omsk. Can you imagine if they actually... Well, they're actually looking pretty thick. I, I, I definitely want to play as Omsk sometime. Definitely. I'll, I don't know much about them, except that they are fueled by something called hate. So... Shield of the motherland, nothing left to lose, and they're fueled by hate. <laughs> Poland Feldzone, Feldzoig. I heard that you can't peacefully reunify with anybody with Omsk. Like it, it's literally just balls to the wall, just going to get push everyone out. So, tourism in Scotland. I already read this earlier, so if you'd like to read about this one, we can sign treaties, of course, to make it easier for people to respect our countries. The black market is available. It's not bad. So, yeah, with the armed force becoming less paranoid. There's literally no paranoia, but warships on the Clyde. Ooh, let's look at that. A letter recently arrived from the one at the Scottish president. It was quite unusual to be receiving one this hour. Robert McIntyre has considered waiting till the next day to read it. However, the curiosity brought Robert McIntyre to open it and read it. It was from the Glasgow City Council and sounded more like a plea rather than a request, and it seems to have been assembled rather quickly and frantically. To President of Scotland. It's come to our attention that warships have moved up into the River Clyde, and this while this would have been, have been seen as a normal procedure. If they had stopped and docked at the naval base, however, as soon as they have stopped or dropped anchor close to the city limits itself, we ask you to please contact, contact the naval admiral responsible for this and to ask why he chose to dock so nearby to the city. Regards, Glasgow City Council members. This is worrying Robert McIntyre. A naval task force should have had no business far up that river. You remember that SMB Clyde was close by, but that close to the city was suspicious. Robert McIntyre had called the Scottish intelligence immediately to discuss the recent dilemma that he had faced. The armed forces seemed to be happy, thought Robert McIntyre. Uh, could they be paranoid about an invasion? These all had been questions Robert McIntyre asked himself. Robert McIntyre pondered these issues before the idea of bugging the ships had been brought up. Robert McIntyre wondered about these options, but that was worried this. He couldn't. This couldn't turn into Watergate, thought Robert McIntyre to themselves. Hope this, is, hope this doesn't turn south. Well, we're back at it, everyone. Actually, what is that? Approval goes down by 0.15. Well, whatever. Let's see. Investigate. Send in the agents. Well, we'll send in the agents. And if it's for this one, if we can't find too much information about it, not going to go all the way and enter a paranoia. Well, it's time for some tourism. OFN Scotch relations. We love the OFN. And academic base is improving too, which I love too. Ah, oh, look at that. Point one more. Ah, oh, we actually are losing political power now. Wow, that sucks. That really sucks. But at least we got that. That's nice. Cut it down. After tourism, American business, I like that idea. Yeah, let's get that so we can build more factories. Training the OFN would mean access to the American market. Even more than that, however, we'll have access to great economic investments in a country that desperately needs after decades of our own. Or decades by ourselves, basically. If we change fiscal laws and make it convenient for foreign enterprises to open up branches in Scotland, we'll see a surge in industrial production. And greatly reduce unemployment. Wow, it finally finished in 64, piece at last. Gently downstream, Adam buttoned up to shirt and he sighed as he looked at the mirror. He'd been a spy, not an errand boy for the Scottish government. He frowned and p finished buttoning his shirt and left his room. He walked out of the inn in Glasgow to a rainstorm that come in early and the streets now had to shine and the whole team smelled of petri petritor. As he walked to the wharf where the warships had docked, he lowered his head and took out his identification papers. He looked at them and laughed to himself. The government had done a good job forging these ones if they could fool the Navy. That's all they need. Adam walked to the entrance of the wharves and showed his papers to the guards at the front. After a few minutes that felt like a millennia, he was weighed on. After walking down the wharf more, he came upon the set where he'd been asked to meet their older brother or the old other members of the operation. I don't know why I said brother. It was an old clock or old dock house that was being used to store dry goods. As he walked in, he noticed there had been three other men waiting for him and it seemed. Hey lad, you know a place so someone can get a good drink around here? The tall one on the left had said this to Adam. The other two flanked him had been absorbed in a game of cards, but both turned their heads to Adam. Only in Aberdeen replied Adam. After he said this, the tall sailor smirked and extended his hand out to Adam. Lewis Shaw, I'm the leader of the mission. The two sitting here are Daniel Cairns and John Bryce. I assume you've been briefed on why you're here. Lewis said this and then pulled out of a book, handed it to Adam. Who nodded? Let's get to work then. Let's find out what's really going on. 
And what else can we do? Decrease black market trading. Meh, that's okay. Minus 360 is not bad. Could be better, but at least the GDP is getting better. That's what we care about, right? Owns research done in about a month. Net vision will be nice. I, I, you know what? I will be. I'll be the first one to say I'm still a little paranoid. If that's the case, I'm gonna go and do this. Hmm, maybe not. Hmm. Because if we do get invaded, like our borders will have to be uh, thought about here too. Go with one more and then train here one at the same time. Actually, no, don't do one more. These guys will be the guys guarding the ports. It'll be important. Bugging the Navy. Lu Lewis walked up the tight corridors of the NS NSN, grabbed him when he came up the officer's lounge. He quickly looked around the corners of the hallway and slipped into the large room. He was cautious while taking or walking through the rooms. It would certainly look suspicious if a relatively new sailor walked into the lounge. He looked into his pockets and made sure the draft device was still there. The assembly seemed easy. All he had to do was to position in a place that is hidden enough and make sure they can pick up a conversation. He surveyed the lounge for a few minutes before finding a spot that would work. He found a disc at a small overhang. It looked perfect. After checking one more time, he crawled under the desk and attached the bug. While this was happening, he heard footsteps and shot up, hitting his head. Lewis scrambled out from under the table and looked for a place to hide. He saw a coat closet and rushed into it. He slowed down his breathing to stay hidden. Then he saw the dark hair of Daniel Cairns. He exhaled a, br brief of a, a breath of relief and exited the closet behind his friend. Daniel had been startled, but after a few seconds realized it was a fellow spy. Daniel was surprised to see Lewis appear from a closet and more at the fact that how he now had a small bruise on his forehead. Daniel had asked if the bug had been planted and Lewis nodded while looking around. Lewis suggested the two go back to the dockhouse to discuss the current revelations. Daniel agreed and the two walked off the ship and out to the wharf. Once they had gotten there, Lewis briefed Daniel on the recent developments about the mission and how they would need to place a few more bugs before leaving. Cairns mumbled and scowled about the idea of it being on the docks for any longer. Another week here? Seriously? Seriously? But American business is what we could use. Results are yielded. Inside Scottish intelligence, a message had been received from Glasgow to receive it from the warships. The operator had listened to the radio and started to write down the details and was preparing to transfer the message to Robert Mc... Uh, President Robert McIntyre. The radio operator sat and began to write down notes, writing fast. He already torn a piece of paper from writing too fast, so he had to be careful. This was one of the utmost importance, of course. He grunted and finished the letter and sent it. Robert McIntyre had called a meeting with the cabinet. They had many details to go over, but the overarching one was the issue of the Navy on the River Clyde. As the members filed into the room, an aide came into Robert McIntyre and handed them a small list that had been hastily written. The ink had barely dried as it was taken out of the envelope. The handwriting wasn't the best, but Mc Robert McIntyre shrugged and could read it. It seemed that the notes had been derived from some officers discussing the plans. All the following info had been transcribed from radio transmission. It read from the top as Robert McIntyre scanned it, scanned by it. It was going towards the better part. The reason why the Navy was in Glasgow. After scanning through conversations, it appears that the Navy is no malice objective and seems to be doing an exercise with the Coast Guard on routine shipping and seems to be preparing for a recruitment drive in Glasgow. Robert McIntyre smiled. Thankfully, the Navy wasn't playing something nefarious, but instead was planning to do a recruitment drive and help the Coast Guard. As the meeting was wrapping up, the members of the cabinet went home, sleeping peacefully now that they didn't have to fear the coup above their heads. They seem to be returning to normal. This seems all nice. I am, I am getting paranoid here. Like, what is going on? Like, why are we so paranoid? That's making me paranoid, you know? Um, at the same time, happy 1965. It's going to be a great year, hopefully. Hopefully nothing bad will happen. The English will love us. We'll love the English. Well, maybe we won't, we won't love the English. But we'll tolerate the English, you know. Hmm. I wonder what Dunehammer's opinion on English is. Hmm. Maybe I shouldn't ask him. Maybe I should. Maybe I will. I don't know. I don't think he's watching. But if he is, that'd be really cool. Wouldn't it? I could send everyone to tell Dune, or ask Dune, what's your opinion on the English? <laughs> oh, Ben is elected. Nice. Will he prove a master of compromise? He might. He might not. My desk. I didn't get a new desk. This is a really creaky one. Oh, American business. Uh, a U.S. military aid, just in case. The shield broken? Oh, no. The U.S. of A. was one of the leading world superpowers. With our strategic position near the European continent, we would, or they would surely understand our usefulness as allies. From here, it shouldn't be too difficult to convince them to help protect ourselves from a potential German aggression. Of course. The more the OFN increases their support, the more likely we'll be able to join their alliance. For now, however, we'll limit ourselves or to request modern weapons and military technology. This won't result in any guarantee, but it's already a good old start. Let's get some more defense and breakthrough. 2%, 1%, not bad. Not great, but not bad. And it feels looking not too bad, too. We're going to need to have the most experienced soldiers. Just in case the English want to invade us. I'm sure their navy is probably pretty good. And our ships are, you know, they're just what we started with, which is not always great. Military austerity. Go by. Goodbye. Wow, there's almost nothing there. Wow. It's so hard to cut down debt. It's not so hard. It just 
tedious. We'll put it like that. Our allies across the Atlantic. Thanks to our dip great diplomatic effort, we now have strong and reliable allies across the Atlantic. Both Canada and the good old USA has agreed to help and protect us, be it economically and militarily. In exchange, we'll do the same for them. From here, it'll only take a small step to formally join the OFN, and are we ready to take this step, however? Only time will tell. In my defense, God me defend. Huh. Anything else? Investigate the army. I mean, I don't want to... I don't... I don't it doesn't matter, right? They're not paranoid, they're indifferent, and the Navy leaves the clock. Lewis was bored, he'd been sitting on a bench reading while the other three spies had been playing cards. Each day it was a different game from Go Fish, Gin, and sometimes Blackjack. They had been waiting on the dock when we were on the loudspeakers. Captain Gordon of the NSN, Belfast, asked all men to come forward to the meeting area. Or to the fore meeting area. Lewis shrugged at his fellow spies and walked to the meeting area. It had been a hive of activity since a few days ago. Now new recruits had flooded the docks, as it seems the recruitment drive had occurred. Once Captain Gordon had arrived, he gave a short speech to the sailors. Fellow sailors, today is a good day for the Navy of Scotland. Our joint mission with the Coast Guard has succeeded. We have interdicted three smugglers who had attempted to destabilize our country, mostly coming from the English with the goal to destabilize our country. Uh, okay. However, one of them was far from the far reaches of Norway. Due to a cooperation with the Coast Guard, they will no longer pose a risk to any good Scottish citizens. Along with these victories, we had a recruitment drive that was aimed to recruit patriot citizens to our Navy. With our missions now succeeded, we can now leave Glasgow. The sailors cheered as they learned that they would be out of port and back onto the ocean. Lewis and the rest of the spies looked at each other. His mission would finally be over. The captain ordered the sailors to attention and then dismissed them. The next few hours had been a hive of activity in the wharf. Sailors ran around grabbing supplies and equipment and preparing to leave and steam back out to the sea. The four spies had already packed up their surveillance tools, not bef before, however. They saluted the captain one last time. See? Nothing bad happened. Nothing bad. The, the armed forces are fine. And then you finally get cooed in the end. Oh my goodness, I'm getting paranoid. Ooh, oh, no, 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 no. And we're almost done with the land auction. Here we go. <sighs> love it. Love it, love it, love it. Man, that gets, this just keeps getting smaller and smaller, isn't it? The amount of money we're trying to get... Of course, we just made another division. That's why. I mean... Hmm. Go ahead and train. 10 combat width is nice. I think at this point... You guys are doing this. I'm going to stop this. 10 combat width should, might be enough on the front line. Yeah, 10 divisions should be enough. I'm going to do that. Because I want to make these guys bigger. So, we're going to duplicate this. And just call them 20s. Alright. 20s are good. Yes, thank you. Throw on the artillery as well. That'd be pretty nice, actually. And how much motorized do we have? We have some uh, recon motorized. There you go. Can we convert? I don't want to convert all of them immediately. I'm going to, let's convert these three first. There you go. U.S. military. And it's going to cost us more money as well. But our allies across the Atlantic. Of course. More stability is good for the nation. That's going to hurt our money, us money-wise, but whatever. Hmm. Of course, then again, I, I didn't make them 20 combo with yet. I made them with more support companies. That's not bad. Yeah. So, oh. Oh, wait, hold on. I don't want to do that one yet. I don't want to do that one yet because... Oh, this one. I haven't done anything for military factory stuff, huh? Yeah, do that one instead. Um, yeah... Arsenal of Democracy. Our new friends across the pond have been more than generous in the support of our armed forces. The Scottish Army's highly trained force, small but a professional, and ready to defend its homeland with zeal. Our methods are tried and true from the days of the British Army, as is our equipment. Scotland's resources are limited, and training can only get so far. The Americans have has a vast budget they can produce, one of the world's most powerful militaries, with all the high-tech equipment and advanced training methods that comes with it. Surely they will be shared happy to share some of their research with the new allies. Uh, our military advisors have consulted with their American counterparts and drawn up a scheme of shared training and technology they believe agreeable to both parties, and will surely make Scotland's military the most well-organized equipment equipped in all of Britain. All that remains is to wait for an official answer. Signed and sent the benefits of cooperation. The Americans have agreed to our proposal of research and development. Cooperation with gusto, eager to show off their new toys and to their friends. Joint Scottish-American training exercises are being implemented, including a series of small-scale war games in the Highlands and maneuvers in the North Sea. Our scientists are beginning an exchange program with their colleagues in America, and the first shipments of American gear are being sent across the Atlantic. With their assistance, Scotland Security shall be assured, and we've acquired a world-class friend. Up your arsenal. Oh, that's such a great game. I love Ratchet and Clank so much. Oh my goodness, don't even get me don't get me started on that series. I love that series way too much. Oh, I love it. Oh, but I wish I wish we were in the OFN. Please, please, please. That would be so good if we were in the OFN. Please. Why not? Why can't we be in the OFN? America, please. Please. Imagine England joins if they would join the OFN. 
But then, like, they invade us. That'd be so mad. That make me. That would make me mad. That'd be. I would say disappointed. But allies have an encouraging nationalism. The, the English have tried to quench or quench Scottish nationalism for centuries. They tried to destroy our national identity and turn us into obedient subjects. But now we are free and will protect our tradition traditions until the end of time. To this end, we'll fill in a small campaign setting our ancient customs so that they can be preserved and taught to our younger generations. The campaign will be organized and led by the newly found Scottish National League, and it will be grow as we expand the scope of our efforts. More liberal democracy? What uh, rate are we at right now? We are currently at 65%. Women. Oh, women in the workplace. Okay. It says something about women, so. But are they gamers? That's the real question. Can I buy more stuff from the black market yet? We could rarely really use stuff from the black market. Cut that. I want to get at least below 2 billion before this gets too much higher. Wow, we have a high tax income rate. Wow, 60, 58%. Wow. Wow. Encourage nationalism. Democracy returns. Italy. Oh, look at that. Oh, no. Not the Dolvanger Brigade. My favorite Russian unifier. I don't know. I, can you reunify Russia? I, or, I don't know. 20th anniversary of the Scottish independence. The band's celebrations get unpacked and bath series are clear to make room for stages. Kids are all eager to help their mothers prepare the dishes for the kinship and school kids, as well as many workers enjoy the day for off from any stress. There are only the blunders of preparations every little village in Scotland goes through. Meanwhile, the big cities like Edinburgh prepare to host Scottish celebrities, musicians, and politicians. A reoccurring sigh for the day of Scottish shooting pens, which for this year was raised to official status of national holiday by the president himself. The modern squad was alive for all forgotten at this day, and from now on, every Scot will enjoy a free day of celebration, drinking, eating, and long-lasting chats with neighbors, awkward meetings with relatives, and a splendor and a sheer patriotism that no Scot can deny not be embraced by. Since 1603, there was no Scotland without the Union Jack raised above its government buildings. But in these unforeseen closure of the Second World War, an independent Scotland emerged out of the demise of one of the arguably greatest empires in human history. Thus, it is the 20th year since 1945 that Scotland can look back on this day when Scotland detached from the sovereign of England. To the Scottish armed forces, it may seem surprising how our nation is not yet overrun by the Wehrmacht, but the paranoia is no matter on this beautiful day that even carries staunch unionists into strong believers of the Scottish steadfastness. Our emergent republic is one of the youngest on the world stage. Nonetheless, let us not forget in what wake and what proximity to death we survive. Carry on, brave Scots, for this day is the first of many. Happy New Year, Dune Hammer. <laughs> I don't know why I always keep bringing them up, but Scotland first, of course. We're to set up camp. We've been on our own ever since the UK fell apart, alone facing dangers much greater than we could ever hope to be. Through thick and thin, we've stuck together, strongly believing in our inner strength as a people, and managed to overcome all difficulties. Now we need to turn our traditions and culture into the fuel which will rise or power our rise to greatness. Scotland the brave, Scotland first. We're to set up our camp, Reno's. Well, probably in a real good place. As is the Scottish National Party, we have a duty not to only stand for our pride in our country, but to promote it. To that end, we're setting up a new youth organization called the Scottish National League. Lots of people in the party think it's a very good idea. The children get to have fun, the adults get to rid, of them, rid, of the, rid themselves of the kids for a while, and we have a generation of Scottish nationalists. It's no-brainer, but we still have to decide where to put it. Inverness is a top choice among many me members involved in the planning of the league, and the reasons are obvious. The Highlands, Loch Ness, the Highland Games. We can have the children do all sorts of fun out outdoor activities in the traditional Scottish sports. We take them on a few hikes and boating expeditions and make them throw a few weights and they'll love this land and the people that live in it. But Edinburgh is also a good choice. We can bring them on many tours of museums and civic institutions. The goal is to broaden the culture and a civic awareness and so they know about Scottish culture and how their nation works. This in turn will make them better citizens and give them an understanding of the long history of Scotland and her ancestors. So there's two choices, two cities, two values we can instill in the youth of Scotland. Inverness for an appreciation of our land and Edinburgh for the understanding of our cultural and political heritage. Uh, S&P, ooh. Are we still, we still have voters? Um, what's the fun of museums all day? Send them to Inverness? I like both. I like both of them, actually. Dirt mosquitoes make the, um, vote ILP instead. Um, I don't want to think about this for now. I want to enjoy the time with everyone else. But it makes more sense for us to do dirt mosquitoes because the campaign will do better over there. And we got to think about campaigns. I personally probably prefer Inverness. I, I Like I said, I like both. I want to do both, but obviously we can't. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's go with this one. No, let's go with this one. Let's go with this one. But, uh, why can't we do both? I mean, or at least have one here, and then in a little while we can go to Inverness. You know, why not? Thank you. Gun-wise, looking not too bad, especially once I want to make these guys 20 combat with. That, that manpower is definitely going to go down. I still don't trust the English. And, auto-saving... 
Takagi. Oh, he's been the elected prime minister of Japan. Look at that. For him. Hey, look at that. We're less than two billion. Nice. Oh, the Iron Man is doing okay. And when's the next research done? In about a little more than two weeks. Pakistan becomes independent. Interesting. Good luck, Pakistan. You should really be under our jack boot, but whatever. Military austerity. Cut. Scotland first. A presidential election of 65. This is why I did uh, uh, Edinburgh. Scotland's first official head of state is a president, although the role is ceremonial and everyone knows a prime minister really holds true power. The race for a president is even held separately from parliamentary races and it does not contribute to any real advantage in the legislative sphere. This does not dampen interest in the position among the major parties who would love to have a victory or at least a strong showing in the election, especially with recent events given the position newfound importance. The S&P, like they have with all of Scotland, have held a position since the foundation of the country. For many years, John McCormick was the leader of Scotland, fading off any challenges with these, but McCormick is gone. And now the ILP and the UP see an opportunity to have their own person in the seat. This election, though mostly inconsequential, uh, inconsequential have now gained out, outsized importance in the political sphere. Candidates have been named, and all parties will put their efforts into ensuring the person ends up on top. Once again, a political battle for the soul of the nation is about to commence, and everyone's treating it as they would a parliamentary race. Muriel Gibson takes it up where McCormick left off. Willie Ross will make it Scotland for everyone. Teddy Taylor will make it in inevitable. Scotland for everyone? Well, I guess we'll probably go with Gabriel Gibson. That's probably the S&P, so... Better safe than sorry, though. After several meetings with the general staff, it's been agreed that the full demobilization is too risky. Even though our borders are no longer under immediate threat of invasion, we are still in range of a potential German attack should they wish to retake their former puppet. It has been therefore decided that any that the part of the army will remain mobilized, and our border defenses will remain active and well maintained. Should anything happen, we'll have enough time to fully remobilize and pray for the best. Oh boy. And we're done with the land auction. Great. Let's grab some of this. Scotland first. Because I wanted to do our nation in the north for that extra sweet, sweet political power. Oh, oh, crap. We have to campaign? Well, the Highlands. So this is why I did Lothian. Lothian. SNP is looking not too bad. Uh, let's see. Oh, we're looking really good so far already. Uh, Scottish SNP. UP. Doomfries? Doomfries. We want Doomfreeze as well as Highlands. Doomfreeze and Highlands. Doomfreeze has 300... Yeah, Doomfreeze first. It's got to be hard be, trying to beat an incumbent. Black market order failed. T pretty typical. ILP takes a uh, political campaign backfires. If you want to read about this, go right ahead. I mean, this is kind of similar to what happened before. Um, socialism isn't popular. Who would have thought? So, the UP rises in poll due to recent efforts. If you'd like to read about this, go ahead. But, uh, remarks upon the Scottish National League opening. That's a concern amongst many adults that the Scottish youth are not able to adequately experience the traditions and activities their forefathers experienced. That they spend too much time glued to TV broadcasting American programs. That they go out for fast food instead of traditional Scottish fare. That they don't spend enough time gaining an appreciation for Scottish sports and culture. But at the same time, there's a tremendous opportunity. We can assemble the youths of Scotland together by railroad or other transport in a singular location. We can show them the areas of their ancestors and have them read what they said in their own words. And we have just have the capability and knowledge to give the youth of Scotland not just a love for the country equivalent to their ancestors, but greater than them. So the powers of me vested by the founders, I, Robert R. D. or well, Robert D. McIntyre, Prime Minister of Scotland, declare the founding of the Scottish National League to provide the youth of Scotland for recreation, activity, and awareness of the Scottish culture. What's the fun of museums all day? Send them to Inverness. Alright. And let's do one more focus before we end the camp. Well, I, we're going to end the campaign. We'll end the episode. We may no longer be the only democracy in the British Isles, but we surely are the best. Our citizens should be proud that we kept the flame of freedom alive in these troubled times. And our government, we should remind them. We'll organize celebrations for our newfound prosperity, and we truly hope that this will mark a new age for Scotland. May this be an age of enlightenment and recovery after the horrors of the last decade. Our campaign ends in disaster. If you'd like to hear about this, just go right ahead. It doesn't matter. I don't really care too much, so. ILP rises. Doesn't matter to me. We should do good regardless. Or do well. Good, good. Eh, we'll do some resource extraction because we can. And we actually have another dude here. Nice. Alright, so we got a campaign again. Uh, we fell down a little bit there, so Doom Freeze is going back. Going straight back to Doom Freeze. Lothian. Where? That's still not bad. It's not too bad. So here, just in case, do we have anyone who's a. Uh, ooh, general max size. Alexander Boswell, we don't really have tanks, so... Uh, who's good on defense? Anyone have four defense? Two, two, old guard. He does technically get plus one entrenchment. You both actually get that. That sucks. Um, hmm. 
Three two three two three two two three. Supply consumption, more max planning. Well, I want less supply consumption, so. Lauren, you're it. So, our nation in the north, and then we shall do, after that one, Scotland and the English. Even though we may no longer be part of the same country, the Scottish people will forever feel a bond of brotherhood with the English. Now that England is free from the German oppressor and we have established normal diplomatic relations, we can further build on this and sign treaties of friendship and with them let our countries continue to grow. But regardless, that's going to end today's episode, guys. If you enjoyed it, please do consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already. And I'll see you tomorrow, which could very well be the final episode in this campaign. Thanks for watching, but have a tremendous rest of your day.